uh, I'm going to turn things over to our very first panel. Uh, I'm going to be bringing out Talia Milgram Elcott, our moderator uh, for this first panel. She is the executive director and founder of Beyond 100K, whose goal is to unite leaders to create lasting change in STEM education. Uh, and she's going to be joined on stage by Johnny C. Taylor Jr., president and CEO of the Society for Human Resource. Uh, Johnny will also be doing a book signing after this uh, downstairs on level one. So if you enjoy the conversation, please check that out as well. Um, they'll be joined also by Patrick Methvin, Director of Education uh, Post-Secondary for the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, uh, Deborah Quazzo, Managing Partner of GSV Ventures, uh, and Scott Pulsifer, President of Western Governors University. So, here to talk about the changes that need to happen in Pathways to Employment, please welcome our panel. Good morning. It is so great to see everyone and to be here together. Also, we don't sing enough together, so it was kind of <laughs> amazing to hear people singing, give me one. <laughs> I, haven't, I haven't heard that song in a long time. So we're not going to do more about bios. You heard a little bit about each of us, and you can find out as much as you want to know as fast as your thumbs can type. But we're here in person, which is still a delight and feels like a huge treat. So we're gonna spend our time talking to these amazing people, and I'm gonna start with Johnny, who is right next to me. It has been said that crises don't create trends, they accelerate them. The pandemic's impact on the world of work is no exception. Simmering trends that predated the pandemic around AI on the one hand, and worker flexibility, remote work, and a desire for purpose, all collided in the great resignation, and then found new, force in quiet quitting, the phenomenon called quiet quitting. But despite reports of the death of work, unemployment is at historic lows. In your book, Reset, you argue that now is the time for leaders to completely reimagine, reorganize, and reset their operations to create a more daring, resilient, and sustainable future. That is a future that everyone in this room believes in. The question to you is, what do people need to know about the, the workforce right now so that young people can have the experiences to allow them to thrive in that future state? Well, thank you for having me here, and it's wonderful. Deborah, thank you uh, for inviting me and convening this amazing group. I saw it's 7,000 plus people. That's crazy, right? But um, what do we need to know? Um, first of all, and I think this is really important, there was a, a date in history that I talk about. All of us know about 9-11, right? You can name it, or your birthday, or the day you were married, or whatever, right? But there was a significant date in history that we should begin to think about as, as a turning point in the world of work, and that was March 13th. Friday, March 13th, by the way, 2020. We talk about Friday the 13th, it was that, right? All of a sudden, you open up the news and, and the president and the government all over the world, not just the United States, are saying the world as we knew it, how we work, when we work, where we work, all of that changes today. And we can't go hire very expensive you know, consultants, change management people to take us through this over six to nine months. It has to happen now. Monday, everything changes. That level of almost a seismic shift in how work is done has profoundly uh, impacted how people experience work. And we're hearing it right now as we talk to folks, in, and we talk all the way early, early, you know, typically middle school, we begin polling them at SHRM to understand what are your thoughts about work. So three quick takeaways. One is they've gotten, we used to always say before the pandemic, get comfortable with being uncomfortable. Well, these folks have really, really embraced that. They are okay with it, right? Number two, culture. What was formerly a soft word, you know, when you, you know, it was foosball machines and, you know, free food and all of that, your employees are over that. That is so 1990s now, you know. <laughs> now it's like we want you to be able to articulate very clearly what the culture is in this organization. That was a big reset moment for us. Like, I don't even care. I'm not here to tell you whether it's a good culture or a bad culture. I just need to know what it is while I make decisions about whether or not I'm going to spend my time with you. And then thirdly, pay matters. 
One of the things that has really, really profoundly changed the landscape in all of our research, and it'd be interesting to see if you support this, is given that you have a generation, first of all, that's never gone through a pandemic. I mean, rather nobody's ex experienced a pandemic, that was dumb, but, but um, has ever experienced an economic downturn. I want you to think about this. The last big downturn was 2008, 15 years ago. That means your 35-year-old employee was in college. And so they don't know what this experience is, and they haven't seen uh, interest rates at 6 and 7%. It's amazing when I talk to people, they're like, can you believe interest rates are at 7%? I said, let me tell you about back in the day. You know, I'm going to date myself, but that's a cheap deal. I remember waiting to get to a 7% interest rate, right? But they don't understand that. And I say all of that to say there is this panic. $2 trillion of student loan debt, et cetera. All of it has financially put some serious, serious questions in the minds of your employees. And so we're, pe we're seeing people work not just two jobs, but three jobs. And that's having a real impact on their productivity, happiness, et cetera. OK, so with that image painted for you, a lot of the people here are people leaders. So I want to flip our view for a second and ask you for some tips. Managing folks in a hybrid or remote environment can be a beast, and it's hard to know. Are people engaged? Are they excited? Are they present? And are they committed to the mission and purpose of what you're doing? Can you share some tips for us as people managers for what excellent management looks like in this new environment? Wow, this is Johnny Taylor show. I didn't know. I was just going <laughs> to I thought I'd get one question. Well, we need able to, to know. Chill out. We have so, Johnny here. A couple of things. Leadership. Empathetic leadership is the number one request of employees across the sand. You know, no longer gone are the days of sympathy. We, during the early days of the pandemic, of course, everyone had their friends and neighbors and family members getting sick, some dying, et cetera. So sympathy was really important. Now it's all about empathetic leadership. People leaders have to really lean into becoming more empathetic in their approach. And again, not to be confused with sympathy or conflated with sympathy, there are appropriate times to be sympathetic or, or show sympathy as well, but there's a big push on empathetic leadership. Uh, related to that is flexibility. You know, this idea that you can tell people what to do, when to do, how to do it, prescribe how they work, when they work, that's gone. Those days are gone. The top-down leadership sort of autocratic style, work here or don't. Well, when you have 3.5% unemployment, 9.9 .9 million open jobs, people will choose the latter on you if you threaten them. So we know that leaders have to be willing to embrace this concept of flexibility. That doesn't mean you cede all of your power to the proletariat and that you cannot manage your business. It means that, that you do have to be more flexible and you can't continue to operate that we have in times past. Those are the two big takeaways. Amazing. I'm going to take it to Deb and ask a question, actually building on this flexibility concept and sort of breaking down some of the silos. It's increasingly clear that learning isn't something that ends with a college degree, if it even includes one at all, and that the 21st century economy is already rewarding lifelong learners. But you've been a proponent of PK to Gray from Go. For many Americans, though, access to meaningful, in real-time opportunities to advance their learning and careers are scant. But you see innovations before most of us see them, before the seed stage, even at what we might call the dream stage. And so we're wondering who is blowing open the ends of the learning continuum, either early or late? Well, I think a lot of the folks sitting on the stage, for one thing, including this man over here on my left. I like the Johnny show, by the way. I kept <laughs> going on that. Um, you know, I think we have been talking about lifelong learning, uh, Michael Moe, my partner, and I, for 25 years. And, uh, you know, it sort of became a, almost kind of trite, and we weren't getting there. Um, so I think we're quite excited that, um, and, and I think the summit this year sort of um, sh you know, shows the, the, the flow through of, of lifelong learning in many, in many, many different ways. So I do think that we're finally breaking down silos. I also get a little frustrated. We, we so focus on higher education, and I, you know, Patrick, that's your life, but in your life, kind of, but, you, but you've already bl blurred the lines, and you, you're blurring the lines. I mean, it's kind of amusing when, like, if you look at the world, what is it, 15 to 20 percent of the entire population in the world actually has a college degree, and we spend all, you know, all the air comes out of the room on the higher ed topic. So we have to really be addressing the 80 plus percent of the population that needs to move forward, have economic mobility, but is not, you know, intending or able to get to get a formal degree. And, and as my as my good friend David Blake from Degreed calls it, jailbreaking the degree is an objective he's had for a couple of decades, and we're, we're investors with David, and, and we have our, always believed in his, his vision about jailbreaking the degree and bringing learning into the workforce and bringing it into corporations. We have a 
theme, you know, around um, work for, you know, em employers as the fourth education system because they have to be. Um, what, one, they're, you know, in, they're ingesting um, workers who may not have had a great downstream experience in K-12 or in higher ed or both. And they are also facing now all kinds of, of uh, job obsolescence issues that are going to require retraining. And, you know, the reskilling and the upskilling and the side skilling and all those words that we all, you know, Johnny just talked about in a session yesterday. But, um, yeah, I think we're very excited about the blurring of lines. We're very excited about pushing higher education down into high school. We're seeing lots of companies that are doing that. Outliers, a company we're invested in here that's here at the summit with some fantastic um, programs that are now being widely adopted, you know, nicely adopted by high schools. Um, and we're and then also just seeing pathways being created for, pe for um, people to go directly into the workforce from K-12 and get skilled in, in, on their way to getting there, because you have to be. Um, and then, of course, and we'll talk about it because everybody's talking about it and you can't not talk about it, but generative AI, I think, just blows the whole thing open. And, um, and suddenly, uh, it, is, it is catalyzing a whole new set, a whole, you know, all kinds of different ways of thinking about learning. I was with Johnny in a, something, in a session yesterday and talked about, you know, how fast, how far, how fast machines are learning, how much faster they're learning than, than we humans can. So that, that calls for dramatic acceleration in learning. And I think the only, you, have to, you have to have some shortcuts when you need dramatic acceleration. And I think generative AI is, is just a fascinating um, development. I think we're all riveted by it, whether you're making pictures on Dolly or whatever. Um, it's a, it's a, I think it's a, a potentially great, great moment for education transformation. But there are obviously some pitfalls too. And don't worry, we are going to get to Sydney in the speed round in just a few minutes. Deb, we were talking about jailbreaking, um, and Patrick, you were talking about what it will take to thrive in the workplace of tomorrow. And Patrick, one of the things that you're thinking about is the things that require uniquely human motivation and human engagement, and how higher education could be an opportunity or a, a, an opening to a pathway when the nature of work has become more divided we have more low-level, dead-end jobs that are highly correlated to shorter lifespans and less well health spans. And we have more high-level, always learning jobs, and that divide has, has only grown. The jobs in the middle largely eroded. You've been fueling groundbreaking innovations in higher ed and beyond. What we would love to hear about, I think, is two to three innovations that exist right now in higher ed to help young people, especially those who might be first in their families to get to college, to be ready to take on the kind of jobs that, uh, Johnny, you were describing, that Deb, I think you're envisioning, and that might set them up for financial sustainability and for their families to have uh, a different trajectory and are less likely to be taken over by technology that can do that kind of generative learning. So first, I want to thank you for not giving me the follow-up question you gave to Johnny, lest there be tomatoes thrown from my team members in the audience. Um, I think. I, you know, I want to seize on the word innovation because we are at a conference that focuses heavily on technology, and I want to posit that, you know, innovation can happen in many other ways. It can be process innovation, it can be business model innovation, a number of those things. Um, and much like Johnny took us back to a specific date and time, I want to give a bit of a history lesson on the pressures that are being applied to higher education that will actually drive a lot of that innovation, right? So if you think about mid-1900s, the innovation, the space in higher education, it became an access play. Pell Grants, GI Bill, uh, expansion of community colleges, et cetera. And that really was the predominant theme up until 06, Spellings Commission. They looked at the data and they're like, wow, we're not doing too well. Um, and that started really the completion movement. And that was the innovative driving notion within higher education. And what we saw from about a decade of that is we saw uh, grad rates did increase, uh, about one percentage point per year, year over year. Um, what we did not see is two important things. One, we did not see equity in those grad rates. So, so gaps as defined by uh, racial identity, in some cases income, they basically stayed the same throughout. Uh, and then the second thing is now uh, lay on top of that what Johnny mentioned, $1 trillion of debt, much more dynamic workforce markets, and people are asking for different things from higher education. So I think the innovative idea, something we refer to as equitable value, is an expectation that institutions can deliver on that. Um, we funded a, a blue ribbon commission with folks like Secretary Spellings on it, and they took a look at the data, and what they saw was out of the 4,000 Title IV receiving institutions in this country, 700 of them 
over half of their students did not have a net benefit from going to higher education. And by that, we defined it as a pretty low bar, which was that you make more than a high school graduate and you've repaid your debt. That is not a high bar. 700 institutions in this country were not doing that. So I think the innovative pressure that is coming is around e equitable value. That may result in short-term programs, things of that nature. Um, but the innovations you can see. You can see at places like Northern Arizona University where President Jose Luis Cruz Rivera literally changed their vision and mission to focus on equitable values. That's our promise, that's our brand promise to our students, our learners. You see it, Scott, at your institution where, I mean, you talk about this a lot actually, is what are you trying to engineer, both on the cost side but also on the career connectivity side. And so I think that innovative set is gonna push in ways that Deborah just mentioned. It's gonna push higher ed into high school. It's gonna cause greater connectivity with the workforce. And those are those are like business model questions. That's not like a tech thing and you know, it, that's a business model question. So I'm curious, that, that was really a picture of what is happening right now. Uh, sometimes you have a privilege, not so dissimilar from Deb, of seeing things that are around the corner as a funder. So can you tell us an idea or an experiment that's around the corner, maybe not fully visible to all of us in the room, that is exciting you even if it's not fully formed yet? I mean, so folks who've been coming here for a decade might roll their eyes at this, but I do think universal learner records are gonna be a big, big deal in the future. There, you know, people are like, I've been to that rodeo, right? And, and I, it, there were a lot of forces preventing that from happening, but if we wanna talk about learner centricity, and you wanna talk about real lifelong learning, which has been, I agree, has become trite in many cases because it's been overplayed, you are going to need to have the record of that learning owned by the learner and have them have the value that they can like share it with whom they want to, that others that's really focusing on their path, which is gonna open up a ton of different paths. And there's been a lot of experimentation. I'm sure a few folks in this room are doing some of those things, but I think we're getting to a tipping point on that in terms of the expectations that within the next five years, I think you're gonna see some of those records hit a degree of scale that we have not seen heretofore. That's interesting. I, I'm gonna to turn to you, Scott. WGU is a fully online university that is running at massive scale, having graduated 300,000 students since the year 2000. Many of them, they're first in their family to go to college or working full time while in college or both. At WGU, every touch point with every student or instructor is instrumented by tech, which has created an unprecedented laboratory for experimentation, innovation, and research because we can understand what's working and what is worth doing and what is not working and worth phasing out or tweaking. So we'd love for you to let us into the secret. What are the top innovations driving your success? No one here will steal them, I promise. <laughs> Actually, we wish everyone would steal them. So uh, I would say that uh, there are a couple things maybe to just pivot off of what's already been said. Uh, first and foremost, I think we need to uh, increase the alignment between educational pathways and opportunity. And so I think that's one of the key things that we focus on at WGU. The second thing is that you have to be centered on value, meaning if that you know, pathway doesn't actually result in attainment, that results in opportunity, economic mobility, social mobility, then why are you doing it? And you have to increase that alignment around value. Third, and probably the most important thing, is that you have to think about the student, the individual is the primary beneficiary of all the innovation that you're trying to power. If the student isn't that primary beneficiary, then you certainly should be asking yourself, then why are you doing it? So from that standpoint, I think we do take a tech-first approach to how do we make that, that journey more student-centric. A couple of things maybe just simply to share is that um, you all know that you're all different individuals. Well, well, we know that too at WGU, and so while we currently are serving around 145, 150,000 students concurrently, I think what we're trying to identify is how are each of these individuals unique, and so we start with trying to develop a true understanding of, of what are their learning challenges, where are they starting with, what are their approaches to learning, how are they going to consume the content, how do they want to engage with instructors, et cetera. And so that diagnostic kind of approach helps us develop a personal learning guide. And every individual has one of those learning guides. That learning guide is primarily then used by all of our mentors and our course instructors, all of the 360 degree kind of student support services model that we have so that we can adapt the whole of WGU to serve that one. Uh, and that's really our o o overall endeavor, is to personalize student experience such that the whole of WGU feels like it was designed for that one student. Uh, one of the other key things that we do is that you just have to start with the recognition that WGU, because we're online, what that really means is that we're entirely technology-based. 
such that the entire journey for a student from the start to the end is instrumented with technology. When you instrument that journey with technology, guess what, you have a ton of, you have a ton of data, you have a ton of information, you have a ton of signals that now is telling you how are these different individuals experiencing it. So you can start to develop what we call momentum models. What are the behaviors that we're seeing this individual go through is such that we have a sense as to whether the momentum is carrying them to those key milestones and those thresholds that we know that they're progressing to completion. That momentum model helps us now start changing how we provide timely, relevant interventions, whether those are technology enabled, meaning they're direct nudges out of our learning systems so that the individual can still pro you know, progress on their own, or whether it's our mentors and our course instructors, uh, how do they need to engage and what are those touch points that they have to engage with. The last thing I would say is that we're investing much more now in the social emotional element of learning. Uh, we talk about learning being a very vulnerable, vulnerable experience such that you want to identify these kind of hero moments as we talk about them. It's like, what are those particular moments where engagement with the student will, will provide that effect, that positive reinforcing effect that this is worth it, that they're gaining value from it as they're progressing through it, that even when they hit challenges or disruptions, that they're still going to do okay? And so there's simple things like when a student passes or doesn't pass an assessment at WGU, what kind of immediate contact do you want to have with the student right after that experience? If they pass it, hey, you need a ton of congratulations. That's a milestone. Here's now the, the skills that you have as a result of completing it. Or if you don't pass it, hey, that's OK. These are the areas that we're going to focus on. You're totally going to pass this. You already have demonstrated all your strengths in these areas. And you also create that positive effect to where emotionally they're prepared to keep advancing. These, these emotional engagements, and even somewhat, Johnny, goes back to what you were saying is like, we're expressing empathy enabled by technology at every you know, stage along an individual's journey such that we can really then keep our focus around our key results. How do we help individuals complete? How do we ensure there's value in return for graduates? And ultimately, how is that done in a very equitable, equitable way so that every individual can succeed regardless of your background, your race, ethnicities, gender, et cetera. It's like, that's important to recognize that every single one of these, uh, these students are individuals that need to have a personalized journey. It's amazing, hero moments that are human, personalized, and instrumented by tech, so they're possible at scale, 140,000 in any given day. We're gonna go into a speed round of sorts right now, and we're gonna start with ChatGPT, or Generative AI, or Sydney, depending on how close you are, and we're gonna do a worst case, best case scenario. We'll start with the worst case, best case afterwards. Um, Scott, why don't we start with you? We'll take it down this way, and then Johnny will take it back across for... Uh, worst case, it gets utilized to effectively amplify cheating in a way that gets really hard to validate the skills and competencies of the individual. It's really hard to actually identify that does that individual possess all the knowledge, skill, and ability that they say they possess, or was that basically replicated by a machine? Best case, too? Worst case. No, just worst case. Oh, just worst. We're going to bring all, all the worst case to you all at once. Yeah, I, I think the worst case from my perspective is that we don't, I think one of the beauties of, of generative AI is how accessible it is. I think as we think about the era we went through in you know, the coding era where everybody was supposed to learn to code, um, which was a lovely idea, except that it wasn't that accessible. Everybody didn't want to learn to code. Everybody didn't know how to learn to code. Everybody didn't have time to learn to code. What's interesting to me about generative AI is that it is incredibly accessible. I was down um, seeing my 85-year-old wonderful mother uh, a couple weeks ago, and she and her friends were using generative AI to create um, a travel, a travel uh, bro uh, plan, itinerary, which is just awesome. So I think that, that the, one of the crimes will be that if we are not, one, it is an accessible technology by definition. It's obviously got some, some real downsides. I think the, the, the downside will be if we can't get it out to people on an equitable basis, and I think that if it if it becomes something that just stays at the you know at the top, and we can't get it to all students, I think the power of it to to be able to personalize and um, and uh, and and move move students along, and if we can't get it to the if if if, if we get a lot of opposition again back to the, I don't want to keep talking about this session I had with, with Johnny yesterday, but but a lot of discussion about um, people pushing back on it. And whether it's plagiarism, you know, whether it's in higher ed where you're seeing a lot of pushback on plagiarism, K-12 also, but in the workforce you're seeing pushback, you know, nervousness about jobs. If there's so much pushback that we can't actually deliver it to all people, um, that's to me the downside. Patrick. 
I'm probably m more concerned on worst case on the societal level than the higher education front. I mean, there's the, the, the risks. I mean, Scott mentioned a couple of those. But they're well documented. Some of those are technical considerations that can be addressed. On the societal front, I get a bit more uh, worried. If I try to bring that, some of the concerns into higher education, it's that, you know, typically when technology, when there's a push in technology, it is not, uh, it doesn't always result in equitable outcomes, either because of the access um, that you just mentioned or about use, who's training the data models, all of those issues. Um, that's the one, it is hard to do good equitable work fast. And what we are seeing is one of the fastest innovation cycles that I've ever seen in my life, which begs the question, like, how are we going to ensure that? I mean, how many times have you seen innovators asking to be regulated the way the current ones are? Because they know, they know the speed, they know it's risky, and so that's the piece that I'm concerned about the most is, is it plays back into at least the space I concern myself with in higher education, that it just the speed is gonna leave a little bit to be desired on the equity front. Unintended consequence uh, of, of AI could be, worst case scenario, that people no longer, or are not, as effectively, critically think. This was one of the biggest concerns from the, I hear the, see the nods in the room. Uh, the, at the top of every list of the last decade was, what are you not getting out of your college graduates? And it was critical thinking. And I'm very concerned, worst case scenario, that the kid who had to process, and maybe it's an adult, maybe it's not a kid, but the idea of figuring things out, problem solving, that you don't have to do that because you tell a machine to do it or solve it for you. And I think collectively that's a real problem from the employer perspective, potentially. Okay, so it's everything from the technical challenges of plagiarism and are you really who you say you are? Are you doing the work you say you are? And what is it? Uh, on the internet, everyone could be a dog, but with AI, anyone could be Einstein. Um, and Beyonce. <laughs> <laughs> if only. Uh, then it would be worth it. Um, but to access, and then some of these social pressures of an industry going so fast that it's begging to be regulated, because maybe the key thing about human capacity to critically think, we outsource to machines and erode. All right, so that's the worst case scenario. Let's take it to the best case scenario. Johnny, you start with us. Yeah, I love what, Don, uh, what, uh, what Patrick was saying in the beginning, is this idea that we can ensure that people's lives are better as a result of it, by giving people access to information that heretofore just wasn't accessible for a lot of people, we can actually improve a lot of people who are less privileged in our societies. I, I'm probably, mo we've used the word pathways a few times here, I'm probably most excited about the potential to help folks navigate the various pathways. So it'll get messier before it gets cleaner in terms of those pathways as there's innovation in the workforce happening. and. When you look at, you know, if I'm a, in college and I've, I'm an advisor, student advisor, I've got a 400 to one ratio, 400 students to one advisor, I need a little help. I'm spending most of the time just finding the right screen of data to have the conversation with someone in front of me to the degree that we can get a little bit of nudge on that so we can help on the pathway. So then that advisor can do uniquely human things, which is outreach, show empathy, engage in that way, then I think that's, that's gonna be a net positive. I'm really excited about on the advising functions and I think on the teaching and learning ones, some of them, yeah, uh, some of them I think it's to be determined. Yeah, I love that point. I think we've already begun to see some um, founders come with, coaching's always been a hard thing to scale, right? And we could all use a coach, we could all use a tutor, we could all use a, I mean, that's you know, long held uh, reality that um, that's not come to fruition. So I'm very excited about the sort of the ability to use generative AI to, to scale Fun, you know, real true coaching models that can actually live with you, you know, on a long thread. Um, so I think that's uh, got, I've got great optimism about the, the ability to, to construct that. I also actually think, I think the, the critical thinking, I'm just in my own use of it, is um, going to an inquiry-based model is not such a bad thing. So if suddenly we're forced to totally revolutionize, I mean, let's be clear, education in, in general, I mean, on the average has not you know, been delivering the results that, that, that we need to be delivering to keep people, as we like to say, give all people equal access to the future. And so if we, moving to an inquiry-based model can be really interesting, and it's certainly, the, you know, Socratic, et cetera. So I, I'm actually intrigued by, and, I, and I'm actually excited by some of the faculty and the K-12 teachers that I've seen who have been already very creative in their implementation and use.
use of, of AI in, lear in learning delivery. So we need a revolution. Um, I think a lot, of, a lot of us agree we need a revolution, and I think this could very well, um, it also could not, possibly could not, but I think it could very well catalyze a revolution. So I'm, I'm excited about that. Um, I actually think the most in, uh, incredible opportunity that we have with it is that if internet democratized access to education, I think AI can democratize learning and instruction in a way that uh, technology has not yet been able to do it. And I think of this simple context down to if I were to self-serve my acquisition of knowledge, skill, and ability, if that's defined as education and learning, that if I basically can combine YouTube University with an AI-powered instructor, it can now contextualize content and instruction to me in a way that no individual human can do today. Even at WGU, utilizing all that data set where we have that 140,000 plus students creating millions of data points that we're already trying to process ourselves with our own machine learning and data to provide more timely and relevant interventions, AI is gonna do that much better with that data set than, than I think we could ever do, such that a, an AI-powered model and approach to instruction, so that now an individual is getting contextualized content, contextualized instruction that's very uh, personal to me, where I am, what I have, how I'm progressing, everything else like that, that that to me sounds like democratized learning. That it is, in some ways, the end of the ivory tower. That you don't have to flow onto this professoriate that somehow are all the harbingers of knowledge. That you're like, oh no, this thing can actually gather all that content, sift through it, make it relevant to me, and it's also gonna teach me and have a conversation with me in a way that helps me internalize that knowledge and that skill. So that to me is like the most promising thing is that you will democratize learning. It's, it's probably, to me, the catalyst for true adaptive learning. So, I can, I, can I just, yeah, one thing on that, because I, <laughs> I, I hope that in our push for personalized learning, that we're not missing out on the benefits, and y'all do this with technology, with the connectivity between people. So I think the, the contextualization down to the kind of segment of one is an extremely powerful and then how do we also make sure that there's connectivity among the learners and, and others in that? So they, it's not another isolating feature of society of which we have plenty right now. And I know y'all put effort into this with existing technology. I'd love to hear, do you have, Scott, any thoughts on AI to drive connectivity in addition to personalization? I think so. I, you know, to this point is like, I think how AI as a technology tool will increase that human inter interaction. So how would we use AI at, at WGU to increase the interaction between our program mentors and their students, between the students and other students? How's it gonna provide those timely relevant interventions that have that empathy component, that have that social and emotional component to it? Because those things are uniquely human, uh, human experiences that that is not the same as actually acquiring the knowledge, if you will. And so how are you kind of creating those supporting, encouraging, you know, experiences that allow me to continue to understand why I'm doing this, how I'm actually prepared to do this, everything else like that. But that then is AI, how to use that as a tool to increase the value of those interactions, the, the frequency of them, meaning more of them, so that I'm still feeling that connection. But that doesn't always have to be how do I learn and understand concept, content. Um, that's the one dynamic that I see generally different between our old model of higher education, which is the content was in a broadcast mode from a faculty member on a stage. And then how did I try to learn that content? Now it's like, actually content is available everywhere. And so how do I get the content that's most relevant to where I am, how am I gonna acquire it, et cetera? And how do I then start having those human interactions that increase the relevancy of that content that I'm learning? How does it actually better prepare me for opportunities? How am I actually gonna increase my ability to demonstrate proficiency and competency in those areas? Like that's where those human interactions become really valuable, but we'd also look at AI as a tool to increase the propensity for those, not decrease them. And to that point, you're going just where I was gonna go. From a workplace perspective, the narrative and the words matter, and they matter quite a bit when it comes to AI. When we say things like AI-led, um, that can freak a lot of people out. I mean, think about it. It's not in your best interest if you're a faculty member in this room and a school is saying AI-led, AI-led, because at the end of the day, we all focus on what does this mean to me and my ability to provide for my family and pursue my career, et cetera. So what we're seeing in the workplace, and I mentioned this yesterday uh, in a panel session with Deborah, is there is such 
fear. If you think about, just pick up any newspaper, check online, whatever, right, read every article, it's what will AI, what jobs will AI take away? That's the focus. And so people can't even get to the benefits of AI. Uh, folks in this room might be excited about it, but let me tell you, there are 333 million other Americans who are not so excited about the prospect of being essentially displaced by these machines. And so we've got to be very careful to change the narrative, bring them along with us, as opposed to creating an environment where they're going to resist it. And so one of the things that I'm hearing a lot, and we're talking about at SHRM, is AI plus HI equals ROI. And it's an interesting narrative where the employees say, okay, there is still a role for the human intel, you know, intervening. You got the AI intelligence and then the human intelligence. If they see themselves in it, they sign up for it. If they don't, they reject it and they will fight you till the end because it's an existential threat to the human experience as we currently know it. Okay, we're gonna take that. I just want to know if those acronyms were real time generated. Was that like <laughs> and was it like you were, if we're doing that real time is like that's mastery right there. Uh, there's a new podcast by Reed Hoffman and Aria Finger that's called Possible. If you haven't heard it yet, there's an amazing episode with Saul Griffith on energy. I can't recommend it more highly. And they ask, what will the world look like if everything breaks in humanity's favor? And opposite of that doomsday scenario. So I'd love for you all in a sentence, max two, to tell us about what the world of learning and earning looks like in 10 years if everything breaks in humanity's favor. Patrick, you want to start with us? I'll go with the outcome. How about that? Because uh, it's riffing on something Johnny just mentioned. The demographers and the economists say this is the first generation where over 50% of our kids are not going to do better off socioeconomically than our students. Breaking in humanity's favor is that we use innovation to bend that curve back. Right, and so for me, that's the outcome. I don't know, maybe you guys have the answer on how to do that. <laughs> yeah, no, I mean, I thousand, my first reaction was complete liquidity of economic mobility and human mobility, and so exactly, if we can sort of counter the projection and actually have learning provide, facilitate everyone's desired mobility level. Not everybody doesn't want to be mobile, so if you don't want to be mobile, that's fine too, but, it's, uh, but to have learning finally enable um, Human mobility at scale would be would be the dream the dream for me. I um, I think in ten years from now I think we'd be at a point where we have a means by we rec by which we recognize the skills capabilities knowledge you know competency that every human possesses regardless of how they acquired it. Uh, we don't have that model today. You know we have these blunt force instruments like do you possess a degree or not. Um, I certainly love, and we at WG are aligned with like the work of Opportunity at Work with skills-based future of things that says our future state has to be uh, a position at which we recognize and are able to actually identify and capture and, and internalize all the knowledge, skill, and ability competencies that an individual has. Uh, I think it's even a Thomas Friedman quote, the New York Times uh, 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 contributor, where he said is like there is this notion of it will be about what you know, not how you acquired what you know. And I think that's an incredibly awesome future state because we won't have this stratified world of skill. Uh, skill or talent is probably a better way to describe it. It's like we'll move away from the stratified world of talent to more of an equitable version of talent where everyone is, in fact, recognized for the skill that they possess. Johnny? Future state, uh, we, we, one, have an ability through all of this generative AI and other technologies and tools to uh, determine what a person can do. Uh, what are you capable of doing? Can you deliver? Do you have the skills that we don't, that we need for a particular job from a workforce, workforce perspective? And then secondarily, and most importantly, if you don't, it can specifically give you the pathway to obtaining it. That's the issue. You've ultimately, it's okay. I mean, we can use it right now in TA, for example, talent acquisition on the workforce side to say, you know, help determine whether or not someone has the ability and to do the job we need them to do. But if the answer is no, that can't be the end of the discussion. It has to be now, how do I help chart out a way for you to become a productive and, and good citizen? Okay, so Johnny, you've just given us the segue to our final question on that pathway to how. This audience is full of change makers. 
tell us one catalytic thing, one how that we can do right now to move us closer to that world you all just described? Am I starting down this end? Uh, apparently. Oh, apparently. Okay. Um, oh, you gotta be fast. Um, I would just say is like, ask yourself the question is like, if, uh, how does this benefit the student? If it doesn't benefit the student, stop doing it and figure out what you need to do to benefit the individual. Yeah, I just think we gotta move beyond traditional paradigms, whether it's degrees, whether it's whatever, wherever all the uh, traditional silos have been and begin to think about a flat and fluid um, delivery of learning and skills and, and uh, so people can each, back to Johnny's point, achieve their own potential. Uh, the visions we expressed had some theme of equity in them and I would say the catalyst uh, there is you have to design with the people that you say your offering is for. You have to change your hiring practices to ensure that's deeply embedded. Focus on value. Ultimately, people are going to do this if there is something in it for them and they're going to get a return on their investment of time and money. So value argument. I love that, and that we will close out. Value for them, value for their community, value for our world. Please join me in thanking this amazing group of panelists.